Welcome back to the 12 Days in March video podcast edition. This material was delivered during a series of live lectures at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. In this edition, we will review metabolic liver disease with a focus on hemochromatosis. In subsequent presentations, we will cover alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency as well as Wilson's disease for the USMLE Step 1 exam. As with all presentations, a PDF of this recording is available at the 12 Days website. So metabolic liver disease, it's hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, alpha-1. Alpha-1, two slides, Wilson, three slides, hemochromatosis, 20 million slides. There it goes. But you need hemochromatosis for iron, so this really is about iron uh, metabolism. And I just think before launching into hemochromatosis, if you can just lock this concept, this transferrin receptor on your brain, it will really simplify things. So here you have iron bound to transferrin. Here's the receptor, but the transferrin receptor is attached to beta-2 microglobulin as well as HFE. And you know what HFE stands for? High iron. High iron. It's just brilliant. I wish everything was so named. HFE, high iron, that's a defect in hemochromatosis. But this is the complex, and you need an intact complex to be able to absorb iron. And if you have a defective HFE, you're not going to absorb iron, so your body is going to chronically think that you're iron deficient. So the problem with hemochromatosis is you just keep absorbing iron because your body doesn't know it's there because you have a defective receptor. That's the disease. So hemochromatosis is a sensing defect. That's the problem. You just keep absorbing and absorbing and absorbing iron because you don't even know it's there. You're blind to it. Imagine that. So how do they present? So you have to know the organs that are impacted by hemochromatosis. And of course, I'll show them to you, but you need to know the liver, bronze skin, diabetes. Do note hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy, arthropathy, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. That iron is depositing in the hypothalamus. That's why they're hypogonad. The pattern, remember I told you earlier, the degree of elevation doesn't equal the gravity of the cause. If you have a patient with hemochromatosis, you don't diagnose it, trouble. They're going to become cirrhotic, and it's just minor elevations of liver chemistries. Don't expect high elevations with hemochromatosis. Can it cause cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma? Sure. Anything that damages the liver can cause cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. Good. This is, this is it. You can only regulate iron absorption. If we can excrete iron, there would be, we'd skip the next 20 minutes, okay? But we can't excrete it. We can only regulate absorbing it. And so who are the players? We have the absorption pathway, the carrier and storage pathway, and then we have things regulating it. And who are the players? So you have the enterocyte, also called the duodenocyte. There's no such thing as a duodenocyte. I made that up, but that's where it's absorbed in the duodenum. You have the, the divalent metal transporter. You need to take in the iron. So that's to get it into the enterocyte, and it travels through ferroportin into the circulation. That's the life if you're iron. It travels in the circulation, attached to transferrin, and it's stored as ferritin, and you all know that. The regulators, look, I have two regulators, and you need to know them for hemochromatosis. One is the transferrin receptor that we already looked at a picture of, and the other thing is hepcidin. So this is really a story of hepcidin because it regulates movement, and if you didn't have a defective hepcidin, you still would not have problems with hemochromatosis. Defective sensing with the transferrin receptor, but this still regulates the movement, and so you have to have an appreciation of hepcidin too. And the way I approach hemochromatosis, the way we're going to do it is I'm just going to talk about really iron deficiency because that's, what that's what's going on here. The body thinks you're iron deficient. So what we're going to do here, you're going to be using for hematology as well. So you have iron. We've eaten. We have iron. It's gotten to the duodenum, and our duodenum has, and it's not that smart, you know, duodenum. It's just a little enterocyte there. It has to make a decision whether to absorb iron. So the way it makes a decision is via how much iron is it's in the cell. So it's got to take in transferrin to deposit the iron into the cell. That's how the duodenum is going to decide whether to absorb iron. And if it's got iron in there, it's like, do you want me to sing it? I got plenty of iron. Okay, I'm not going to sing it. All right, I will. Um, so if there's a lot of iron in the duodenum, in the duodenocyte, it doesn't need more iron. So the next question is, how the hell did that transfer an iron get in there? It went in there through the receptor. We just looked at the receptor. That's how it gets in there. And if you've got a lot of iron, a lot of transferrin, you know, carrying iron, it, it goes into the cell and everybody's happy. So in that instance, here, this is normal. If your iron replete, the duodenocytes have plenty of iron taken into the cell via that transferrin receptor, and it's like, no, nah, I'll take a pass on the iron. 
we regulate absorption. So I'm not going to absorb iron if the Dewan site is full of iron. But if you have a defective receptor, you don't even know you've got iron, so you're going to keep going. So the body regulates absorption, check, and it's all based on that transferrin receptor. Now, this is still normal. Here we have someone who's iron deficient, high transferrin, low iron. There's, there's no intracellular iron. And so now what happens? That upregulates the production of the divalent metal transporter, okay, through iron response elements that we don't have to know. No iron, upregulate divalent metal transporter to increase our absorption of iron. These are made in the crypt. They migrate up the villus and at the brush border. That's where they'll ultimately appear. Now we have iron. We made more of these divalent metal transporters. We're taking in the iron because we're iron hungry. And now once it's in the cell, it doesn't just live in the cell, it's got to be transported. So it goes through this ferroportin channel. So ferroportin is another one of the players here. So it goes through ferroportin into the circulation, the capillary, where it binds to transferrin. Transferrin carries two iron molecules. Okay, so far so good. Now, the issue, like I said, is hepcidin regulates movement. This step over here, is regulated by hepcidin. Hepcidin will degrade the ferroportin channel, it'll block the channel, that's what hepcidin does. So if you're iron deficient, hepcidin is low. The iron you take in just travels through the ferroportin channel. If you have plenty of iron, hepcidin will downregulate the, the channel. That's what hepcidin does. So you're iron deficient, it's low. If you have plenty of iron, hepcidin goes high, blocks the channel. That's the role of hepcidin in this process. And I think that's what I have summarized here. So here's the disease. Moving on to the disease, there are two defects. The enterocyte is not sensing iron because of the damaged HFE uh, effect on the transferrin receptor. So it upregulates the uh, transporter and you're bringing in a lot of iron. That's part one. But part two is you've taken in all that damn iron, but you're also upregulating ferroportin because you have a similar deficit. This is the second lesion in hepcidin. Hepcidin is not degrading these ferroportin channels. So the iron you're taking in is going into circulation and depositing in your organs. That is hemochromatosis, as well as we reviewed how iron is impacted by iron deficiency. Okay? The only thing I want to tie in right now, which makes sense to do right here, is the anemia of chronic disease. IL-1 so in people with chronic inflammatory anemia, high IL-1 levels, it stimulates hepcidin. And what hepcidin does is traps iron in cells, the reticular endothelial system. So iron is not available in our circulation. It's not available in our circulation for bacteria to use to proliferate. That's why this happens. IL-1 also decreases EPO production. So IL-1 is a major a product in anemia of chronic disease. So hepcidin regulates the movement of iron the HFE defect has to do with the absorption of iron. What do we need to know? Can't regulate iron excretion, only absorption. Here are the organs involved, check. When they talk about multi-system diseases on the boards, this is the kind of disease they're talking about, check. The diagnosis, and we're gonna spend some time on this, is on the lab. So high transferrin saturation, iron to TIBC, you're gonna be real familiar with that in a second. Elevated ferritin, which is storage, that makes sense, you have a lot of iron, so you're gonna store it. The defect is on chromosome 6, and the liver biopsy. You're familiar with Prussian blue staining for iron, and that's an easy one. Whenever they give you Prussian blue, it's iron. Here's a dark liver. Here's Prussian blue stain in a patient with hemochromatosis. Well, uh, this is busy, but it's easy. So these little fellas here are ferritin. Ferritin is storing iron. They got iron in the middle over there. So to diagnose iron states, be it deficiency, or in this case, hemochromatosis, Right, you know the serum iron, there's normal value. Hemochromatosis, we know we have too much iron because we absorbed all the damn stuff. Ferritin, we know, is a storage form, so that's high. Everybody's comfortable with iron, everyone's comfortable with ferritin. This TIBC and transferrin saturation makes people a little crazy. Normally, uh, transferrin is only a third, 30% saturated, so at any time, transferrin has adequate binding capacity. So here's iron binding capacity. If you have unbound transferrin, it's a high iron binding capacity. If you have transferrin that's saturated, it's a low iron binding capacity. So here with hemochromatosis, lots and lots of iron. Virtually all the transferrin is bound to iron. So you have a high iron, but your iron binding capacity is low. There's no transferrin capacity left to bind more iron. It's a low iron binding capacity with hemochromatosis. 
Iron deficiency anemia is the opposite. You have a high iron binding capacity. You actually, with iron deficiency anemia, you actually make more transparent. So there's even more of it, higher iron binding capacity, less iron, low transferrin saturation. Okay, so you have to be familiar with the transferrin saturation, iron binding capacity, and that's it. So people with hemochromatosis, high iron, high transferrin saturation, low capacity, high ferritin. All right, treatment is just phlebotomize these people. If you have iron overload, you use chelation, defroxamine. The place you'll hear about defroxamine is probably not with hemochromatosis. You'll hear about it with other iron overload states like thalassemia. Uh, with iron overload, use defroxamine. And what happened? Mucormycosis. So mucor uses defroxamine as a siderophore. It actually makes it grow and proliferate. Iron and fungus, that's an overlap. Just to let you know on treatments, you can give hepcidin infusions to treat this condition, so high hepcidin to stop the iron movement, but it's way more expensive than just phlebotomizing the patient. All right, so that's, that's it on hemochromatosis. And that concludes this detailed discussion of hemochromatosis for the USMLE Step 1 exam. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 days. Thank you.